There's probably no regiment in the British Army seen more by the public than the Household Cavalry. With the Foot Guards, they're part of the Household Division, and in their ceremonial role, a daily sight on the streets of London. It is this ceremonial job, as personal guardians of the Sovereign, which distinguishes them from other cavalry formations. Every day, tourists come from all over the world to see the Queen's lifeguard mounted here at Horse Guards Parade. In the day of King Charles II, Horse Guards was one of the entrances to St James's Park, which was then the King's private enclosure. And it was in King Charles's time, at the restoration of the monarchy in 1660, that the household cavalry has its origins. There were two regiments of lifeguards. They'd been the King's bodyguard during his exile in Holland and became his personal guardians when he returned to England. The Royal Horse Guards had been cavalry in Cromwell's army, known as Crook Ironsides after their commander, Unton Crook. Later, they were known as the Blues because of their blue livery. And also in 1661, the new queen, Catherine of Braganza, brought Tangier in North Africa as her dowry. The troops sent to guard Tangier were the first royal dragoons, dragon, French, for the muskets they carried as mounted infantry. For 300 years, these regiments were involved in every major conflict through a period which saw the creation of one of the largest empires in history. And one of the greatest battles, Waterloo, in 1815, ended more than a century of conflict with the French. There were two cavalry groups in the Household Brigade, the Lifeguards and the Blues, in the Union Brigade, the Royals. At the farm of La Haye Sainte, the British cavalry overwhelmed the French, but the cost was high. Nearly half the Lifeguards were casualties. But it was at Waterloo the Royals captured the Imperial Eagle, a standard of Napoleon's infantry which was brought back in triumph by Captain Clark and Corporal Stiles, and it's an emblem which remains with the Blues and Royals to this day. Fifty years on, the Royals were involved again in the Crimea. Here, as part of the Heavy Brigade, they charged the Russian cavalry at Balaclava, and unlike the Light Brigade, emerged victorious with few casualties. Egypt, 1882. Both lifeguards and blues took part in the famous moonlight charge at Kassassin Lock. The army of Ahmed Pasha, which threatened the Suez Canal, was routed here at a cost of only eight casualties. And the problem of portraying a night attack was solved with some imagination by one artist. Over three centuries, the battle honours of the household cavalry makes a long list. Although today the public mainly sees their ceremonial work, this is only one part of the regiment's story. In World War II, horses were replaced by armoured cars. Tasked with reconnaissance, the household cavalry was usually far ahead of the main forces. Nowhere was this more true than after the invasion of Normandy in 1944. Here they led the advance through northern France, as the present commanding officer recalls. There's a great dispute between the Hazard Cavalry and the Foot Guards as to who was the first person into each town and village. But if you really go into it, into the historical records, and in fact I was out in Belgium last year, if you ask the locals, they do all remember that the recce screen of the house, second house of cavalry regiment were the first people through, but of course, by and large, they, they would press on and bypass the enemy and, and continue their, their route-proving mission. Since the Second World War, the household cavalry's had many roles as part of NATO, in heavy tanks, peacekeeping with the United Nations, in addition to ceremonial duties. But whilst the mounted part of the regiment's based at Hyde Park Barracks in London, the service regiment, with its armoured vehicles, is at Windsor. Here, the regiment is back in the reconnaissance role the household cavalry did so well during the last World War. Second in command at Windsor is Major Simon Doughty. Hello, second in command. Blackadder. Yes, th that is taking place... So what is it about his regiment which, for him, makes the household cavalry so special? Well, it, it is unique because we combine both the, the ceremonial uh, element in London with very much an operational element here. And that's what makes us unique. Uh, we're part of the household division, which is in many ways different from the rest of the army. 
uh, we had very high standards of training, very high standards of discipline. Uh, the soldiers are, I think, more self-assured and, and perhaps more disciplined, certainly smarter than some in other parts of the army. The, the high standards that, that are required to uh, mount ceremonial public duties in London have traditionally maintained a high standard elsewhere. And the fact that we're now a highly technical organization down here um, has combined very well with our more traditional skills as, as horsemen and as ceremonial soldiers. Uh, it, it comes initially in the way in which we train soldiers. Uh, we demand very high standards in training. And then we, we, we continue to, to demand those standards in, in the regiment. Tournaments, London. It's here the public has a chance to see another side of the household cavalry, the musical ride. There are 16 troopers in the musical ride, chosen from the lifeguards and the blues and royals. With rough riders, trumpeters and the mounted band, they perform a choreography on horseback which has captured the imagination of the public. It's a unique display and one of the most popular events at major shows. But learning skills like these does not come easily. Most members of the musical ride had no experience on horseback before they joined the army. Their performance here comes from weeks of intensive training. It's back at Hyde Park Barracks that the ride perfects its routine. The basic riding course for ceremonial duties takes 20 weeks, but the ride demands much more. Troopers have to control not just their own horses, but synchronize them with the rest of the troop, often at full gallop. Training at this level is supervised by the riding master, Major Dougie McGregor. The people we select for the ride are all mounted duty men. We've all done a basic 20-week riding course, 16 weeks in khaki, four weeks in ceremonial dress. The rough riders are people who are, are qualified riding instructors whose job it is to teach new riders coming to the regiment the art of riding. All, I should think 95% of all the people who get in the household cavalry have never ridden before in their lives. Again, the biggest majority of the horses are purchased from Ireland, who have a purchasing commission, who go out two, sometimes three times a year, to buy the horses that are required from throughout the army. Some horses find it extremely easy, some horses take more time. The biggest problem in the ride is to get horses and the riders to get the confidence to do the scissors. Not only the single scissors, but the double scissors, when the, the amount of error is extremely fine. It's all a question of time and patience to, mo to mold everything into one before the first performance of the year. a lot of places you can see a cavalry charge today outside the musical ride but the foundation for this horsemanship starts early here at combermere barracks windsor soldiers get their basic training in equitation everyone in the household cavalry has to ride and for recruits there's a five-month course right at the start of their training and it's not just recruits more senior ranks officers and ncos are also involved this training's in the hands of a senior riding instructor, Corporal Major Bobby Boyd. In riding school, they each get their own horse to look after uh, under supervision of an NCO. Um, the first riding lesson, we teach them all the movements around the horse. Um, obviously, the safety, again, uppermost in the mind, always to move around the front of the horse, never behind. 
Um, then we start the first uh, riding lesson. We do a system which is called quickest and best mount, where they jump up beside the horse and fling their right leg over and away they go. So they move off as a ride and the whole of the first lesson is usually done in walk and finish off with trot. And during that lesson, the, the whole thing is based on balance and confidence. And your heels down and your toes up. And just keep that rhythm going all the while. We don't use stirrups for the first, usually the first eight weeks, um, apart from when they hack out. And that's simply because if you teach them balance in the early stages and they develop a good, strong, independent seat, uh, what we find is in the later stages this really does come into effect and they can ride most horses on most uh, situations. Right, once they've uh, done the fourth week onwards, what we generally tend to do is um, just introduce some of our more military movements. Uh, they start to work in, in sections, they start to do more manoeuvres um, under drill type situations, so they have to move off at the same time, have to be dressed off all the time, um, once they've got over that initial learning curve. When they get towards their latter part of their training, we introduce jumping, um, we do various jumping exercises, which is all based on strengthening the rider up for if the inevitable happens, if a horse tries to throw him off on a parade, he can grip at the right times, he can keep his balance at the right times. What we introduce um, in this stage of the training is a jumping lane where the riders go down without stirrup irons and we introduce something which we call the hands on the heads. So they've got no stirrup irons, no reins and they come down into the lane and they actually jump the fences with their hands on their heads. And again, well done. And the next. Leggy, leg, leg, sir, leg, come on, leg. Confident, sir, get your hand up. Come on, sir, you're not in Leicestershire now. At this stage, these soldiers are about halfway through what's called the khaki ride, but once they've mastered basic horsemanship at Windsor, there's more to come. Back in London, they spend another month learning how to do the same thing in full ceremonial uniform. This is not as easy as it might seem. After they've passed out of khaki, they come up to London, and for four weeks they learn to ride in full state kit. The this kit is what you would see on the Tribune of the Colour and any escort of Queen's Lifeguard and Horse Guards. Um, it is a very difficult thing to learn to ride in. It's a little bit like being encased in tin can, if you like. You have a helmet on your head which um, sits quite precariously, particularly for a lifeguard because you have it under your chin, uh, sorry, under your lip rather than your chin. Um, you learn to carry the sword, which again, after a little while, becomes quite tiring. So you need to strengthen your right hand up to make sure you can carry your sword correctly. We do various movements to do this, uh, the recover where you raise your, hall, your sword up to your face and then back down to the carry again which is down to your thigh again. And the whole thing is designed just to prepare you for riding in a very uncomfortable order of dress. During kit ride we teach the soldier in his full state kit to ride in sections and when he rides in sections means they always move off in fours and um, they'll go out into the park and they'll do various drills on Rotten Road, along the Serpentine Road in Hyde Park. They do section work where they're always wheeling round, they wheel to the right, wheel to the left and the whole thing is designed so that they are totally flexible on top of their horses so whatever you ask them to do once they've finished their training, whatever, if they're going into Buckingham Palace or going down to the horse guards, they know all the various movements. Canter. Ride. Canter. But cavalry training isn't just about riding and ceremonial duties. The regiment has two roles, and back on the service side, there's a whole range of trades soldiers have to learn. In its reconnaissance role, the regiment uses light armoured vehicles known as CVRT, standing for Combat Vehicle Reconnaissance Tract. This one's a Spartan command vehicle, but there's a whole range in the CVRT family. Scimitar is the light tank. Armed with a 30mm Raden cannon and a machine gun, it can pack a nasty punch. And there are other versions, including guided weapons and Samaritan, the armoured ambulance. Here, at the Royal Armoured Corps Centre at Bovington, soldiers learn the trade skills needed in the armoured role. These skills are signals, gunnery and driving. Well done. 
Senior instructor on the driving course is Norman Hunter. His job is to teach soldiers how to look after tracked vehicles and drive them both on the road and off it. The object of the courses is to take a, a, a totally untrained man, or rather somebody who's had his six weeks or so basic training, and provide him with the skills to maintain and use the tank in all situations, be that on the vehicle park where he's just doing basic maintenance, or in Bosnia where he'll have to drive it tactically and uh, take care of his crew at the same time. Yeah, it's a very systematic process. You know, Initially, we'll just get them put into first gear and then just drive them forward. Once we've got them used to uh, changing up and changing out and steering it um, around cones and so on, we'll take them out onto the, uh, the driving circuits. And there it's very much like a normal road and they're just free to, to drive as they would do on the public road. Of course, that gets a little bit boring after a while, so it will increase their uh, enjoyment and excitement. So we've got a, a few obstacles on there, a vertical step up and a trench and that practices them in their uh, use of the controls. Of course, if they're driving cross-country, they've got to be used to uh, going across large mounds of earth and, uh, and other obstacles like that. Uh, and so the step-up practice of them rising up across a vertical obstacle. One of the problems with CBR, with the engine being at the front of the vehicle, as the vehicle drives up onto the step, there's a lot of weight at the front. As it reaches the point of balance, it very quickly tilts over, or rocks over, onto its front sprockets. Um, and that can be very uncomfortable for the crew if the driver doesn't know what he's doing. When they first start driving cross-country, uh, the main problem is getting them used to the, the undulations of the ground, the ups and downs. The biggest uh, thing we use uh, for that training is the knife edge. Of course, that gives them an opportunity of driving up a very steep slope and then down a very steep slope, under control, of course. Uh, the biggest problem is the, the transition between the up and the down, and that is a, uh, a dangerous and quite often very uncomfortable and frightening time for the driver and the crew. The main vehicles uh, the ROT drivers use are the um, CBR range vehicles, the Challenger and of course the Challenger 2. Challenger by its very size uh, is a very exciting vehicle to drive. With CBR, it's lightweight, it's small size, I mean it's extremely agile and fast. This also makes it a lot more exciting than Challenger to actually drive. And the drivers, I think, at the end of the day, get a lot more satisfaction through driving CDR um, across country than they would do Challenger. Learning to drive a tank needs extensive facilities, but back at Windsor, the Household Cavalry has its own establishment for another key trade. The gunnery simulator is a cutaway turret, complete with 30mm cannon. Targets are models on a three-dimensional landscape. Here, a hit or miss is indicated by a red laser spot. This simulates a real live round. What we shoot at uh, for a static target is what we call a T3. But a T3 is an actual proper target on the open firing range. Uh, it's like a turret top, if you like. And they are the size we deem necessary to practice our gunnery. In the simulator, they are a T3, but a heck of a lot smaller, because obviously we're in a simulator. Uh, and that's what we practice against. We don't practice against full-size targets. We always have slightly smaller ones like T3 to improve the gunnery. When you're ready, Commander, give up. Action! 800 APC left Lieutenant Cops. 800 drone. Little fight. Oh, no. What's it at? 200. Oh, no. Drop 200. Start. Drop 400. Drop 400. Go on. Target three rounds. Target stop. Okay, quite a few mistakes there, Gunner, especially with your responses. Let's think about the standard correction. Yeah? yeah. Add 200, drop 100. Okay? And vice versa. Well done, Commander, for stepping in there. No problems. Okay, let's try that engagement again then. A moving target's a lot more difficult for a gunner than a static target uh, because he has to track the vehicle. Tracking, getting the correct point of aim on there before firing. A lot of people tend to try and ambush the target, which is it's wrong in gunnery terms. Well done, no problems at all there, Commander. Well done, Gunner. Good.
good standard correction there. Let's keep it up. OK, then. After the theory comes the practice. Once trainees have qualified on the simulator, they go to the gunnery school at Lulworth for training in live firing. Instructors seconded from the household cavalry have an important role here at Lulworth. They help train soldiers from other regiments, as well as their own, both on scimitar and other types of armour. This crew has been tasked to set up and test fire scimitar using a variety of targets. Driver, you go on with whatever you've got to do, and Gunner, what I want you to do is to get up into the gunner seat, and I'll actually take you through the bore sighting procedure. Everybody happy with that? Good. Crew, crew, shut! As detailed, break! But just as they're about to begin, there's an interruption. This is Challenger. Over 60 tons, with a formidable performance across country, armed with the 120mm gun and armoured against any known opponent. Rated by many as the queen of the battlefield, this is arguably the most powerful tank in the world. Although the household cavalry hasn't been assigned Challenger since the Gulf War, instructors seconded by the regiment to the RAC Gunnery School are still very much involved. Even from behind, the shockwave from Challenger is considerable. This gun is an awesome weapon, larger today than the main armament on many naval warships. Now the turn of the crew on scimitar. Although much smaller than Challenger's gun, the Raden cannon has a very high velocity. Very accurate, it's also capable of automatic fire. We'll turn it on. Fire it now. Reconnaissance units normally avoid taking on larger tanks, but with this weapon they can disable or deter an enemy in most situations. It pays to prepare for the worst. But people don't often realise that these soldiers, trained professionals and part of the nation's defence, have another life, the one the public sees in London. Here at Hyde Park Barracks is home to 300 horses of the Mounted Regiment, divided into two squadrons, one of the lifeguards and a second of the Blues and Royals. So come inside now with us and meet some of the men of the Household Cavalry. Well, I'm Squadron Corps Major of the Lifeguards Mounted Squadron and that entails basically ensuring that the day-to-day -day administration of the squadron runs like clockwork and also long-term planning, ensuring that requirements for, say, uh, Trooping of Colour, we've got enough men and horses uh, to fulf fulfil the commitment. People say that the youth of the day is nowhere near as good or bright as it, as it was years ago. But uh, I should say the vast majority, the groundwork's there, all we have to do is then build on it to, uh, to bring them out. There are times when you shout and there are times when you talk man to man. A lot of the time you sort out the all that's problems. And by doing that, you can't afford to shout and scream. You've got to treat them as human beings. And that's, that's the way I try to work it. For the troopers, life at Hyde Park is all about the horses. Working with them every day, they become very attached to each other, both as companions and friends. I had, like I said, I had one special horse. Her name was um, Lusitania. That was my main uh, Queen's lifeguard horse. I took her on um, guard virtually every time I went on. Um, guaranteed number one boxman because she's a really smart looking horse. There is uh, a few other ones that I really do like. To me, they're like big, cuddly, overgrown pets. They're very cute. But looking after horses is only one part of the job. What the public doesn't see is the amount of work needed to look after and clean the kit used on ceremonial parades. This can take anything up to six hours or more for a Queen's lifeguard. These uniforms haven't changed much since the 18th century and there are no shortcuts. This is the real thing. Some of the younger troopers we last saw at Windsor have now passed out as qualified dutymen. Now they're based here in London. Do the, uh, the 
the uh, front of the helmet first. I'll just do that because it takes too long to... After you put the brasso on, get a duster. So it puts brasso off. With a chalk brush. Chalk brush into chalk. And this, this actually gets in all the nooks and crannies. <laughs> uh, you repeat this process all over the state helmet until it's all nice and shiny. And hopefully you won't get picked up on an inspection for it. As you can see, I'm doing it on a, what I call my white cloth. Um, I try and keep it as logical as I can, laying on the kit out in line, so I don't lose anything or do a bit twice or forget to do a piece. I've only done one staycation, and that's the Open Parliament, and on that I was on the staircase party on foot. And that lasted about uh, an hour and a half. You get really down doing your kit, but when you're out there, it's a bit of a buzz. And you feel really impressed. Sat there on the horse going down, past Buckingham Palace, where all the people there were in Chenier de Guard, hundreds of people there, and they all turn and look at you. You feel so proud of yourself, and nothing beats it. Once the horses are groomed and the kit cleaned, there's time for a quick break here in the Naffy. A moment to relax, have a cup of tea and something to eat. There are other facilities here too, including the Naffy shop. For Terry and James, this is a good moment to pick up some odds and ends before joining the others in the canteen. This is perhaps one of the most exclusive shops in the West End of London. To actually live in Knightsbridge itself is brilliant. So central into London, everywhere it's just all the best nightclubs, all the best pubs, it's brilliant. It's a proud regiment, you know, it's, it's a good regiment to be on it. You know, it's got steeped in tradition, I and mean, it's over 350 years old. Uh, the battle on is the, you know, the, how it's held in the public eye. I wanted to be in something that was, that was well known and that, you know, I could take pride in, you know, saying I was in that regiment. And, you know. I studied horses at college, and uh, there was nothing really going around my area for horses at the moment. And I was always interested in joining the army anyway. It was just made up my mind, horses, the army, both together. Every day they change the guard down at Horse Guards Parade. One day it's the Blues and Royals, the next it's the Lifeguards. Getting ready for parade is not straightforward. Troopers are expected to have perfect turnout, but all the work is wasted if their kit gets scratched or scuffed when they're getting dressed. This needs lots of care and you need someone to help. Even so, it can take up to 20 minutes to get ready for parade. Because Lifeguards are all about showing off to the public. Um, when you're upstairs doing your kit, you do it obviously for your own good, to your best standard, so you get the best reliefs, and then you get out there and you show off to, your mate, to everybody out there, it's brilliant. I mean, I've been happy photographs, it's unreal. <laughs> it's excellent. In just a few minutes, they'll be on parade for Queen's Lifeguard, and their horses too. They've been got ready down in the yards by the soldiers not on parade this time. Getting on a horse wearing full kit is not straightforward at all. You do need assistance, and in this situation, the quickest and best method is definitely a non-runner. The band's been getting ready too. They'll be leading the new guard down to Whitehall. Today, the new guards provided by the lifeguards will be taking over from the Blues and Royals. Guards, the Blues and Royals are lined up, facing the lifeguards as they wait for the clock to strike. Right 
Four troopers are detailed off. Known as the first reliefs, they're called forward to take their horses through the arch away to the stables beyond. The Queen's lifeguard has sentries on foot as well as horseback, and there's a good deal of competition for the mounted jobs. It's decided by turnout. Those with the smartest uniforms get the mounted duty in the sentry boxes. They are referred to as box men, and it's this job in front of the public that everyone wants. Now, the new box men from the lifeguards are ready in the yard for a final inspection. The Blues and Royals, their duty over, are due to be relieved, and it's this moment the public have been waiting for. The crowds gather round as the corporal in charge comes out into Whitehall to stop the traffic. As their relief centre the boxes from behind, the old guards come forward, turning in the road and back into the yard, as the lifeguards take over for the next 24 hours. Away from Whitehall, on Horse Guards Parade, the band moves off. This time, leading the Blues and Royals on their way back to barracks. This job, as Guardians of the Sovereign, has been going on now for more than 300 years. It's the traditions that go with that which explain the high standards. But it's not all work. For the horses, the stables at Horse Guards are a lot more relaxed than their normal home. Here they can rest in comfort between turns on duty. At the end of the day, the troopers too have somewhere to relax. In the bar at Hyde Park, there's time for a pint and a chance to talk over life in one of the army's oldest regiments. But none of the men doing ceremonial duties in London can forget the household cavalry's service function. As a reconnaissance unit with armoured vehicles, they can be called on at any time, whether by NATO, United Nations or in the national interest. Tom Thornycroft, commanding one of four squadrons based at Windsor, explains their role. It's threefold. We are conventional medium reconnaissance troops, i.e. the ears and eyes of the commander, so he can plan his battle uh, and he can, we, he can predict a battle before it happens from our information we give him. Once the main force has landed or moved into a certain area, we deploy well forward of the main battle groups, and that can be up to 40, 50 kilometers in front of the battlefield. And I would send, from my command vehicle, I would send my troops, three or four, into cover an, an observation line, which is anything up to 20, 25 kilometers wide um, on certain ground. Clear that MSR route point, along behind call sign Alpha 10. Uh, he is searching degree level 3, uh, so you should be clear, but uh, let's have a full route recce when you do it. Now. Uh, go down to five minutes notice to move. Uh, this call sign will go to immediate notice to move to follow up behind. Hello Zero, this is Alpha 23. And now at crossing Oscar and no enemy sighted. Shall I move on over? In your own time, carry on. Once you go, once this is it, to move forward quickly, you will break out into to a, a file formation to move forward whilst covering your entire front into the area of observation. You always have one foot on the ground so that if anything tries to engage you or something is happening out there, that one foot on the ground can see it and react to it, whilst the other foot that is moving moves past and onto the next bound, i.e. the next part of land which can still cover the previous bound but looks forward onto the next bound. Well, Alpha 2 Zero, this is Alpha 2 Three, firm now, out. You have to have mutual support from whatever position you're in, i.e. you have to be covered by somebody else in whenever you move. And in single file, you would be using what's known as sneak patrolling. And that is what you would use to get quickly from A to B in a tactical way. Once we've deployed, 
forward, uh, we tend to go into harbour areas. A defensive arc, is you, you usually describe it as all-round defence. And within that all-round defence, parts of the force are broken down into arcs. And their part in the clock face for an all-round defence. The squadron are moving out to Bosnia for a six-month tour. And we're very lucky because we are taking over from another lifeguard squadron out there. You're in a very lucky position of knowing on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis what is actually going on. Every year, in August, the men and horses of the Mounted Regiment get a break from duties in London. Summer camp is a big event for the horses. It's their holiday. It gets them out of a big city centre into the countryside. It's much more natural here, and they really love it. For the men, too, there's a chance to practice their horsemanship, perfecting a variety of skills, as Colonel Rogers explains. The, the Mounted Regiment also take part in all the ceremonial occasions that happen in the air and a lot of other occasions which aren't seen publicly, like all the investitures at Buckingham Palace. Uh, we provide staircase parties and um, various troops for. So in order to give everybody a break, this is both the men and the horses, we uh, move the whole regiment down to Norfolk at the moment every year for a fortnight. It's primarily, I would say, it's a holiday, but of course it does improve everybody's riding skills enormously. You have to do some proper riding. There's no doubt that being able to ride a horse cross country or show jump it or, or get out and about um, and, and canter and, and trot and get on with it does the jockeys a hell of a lot of good. And it's very interesting watching the recruit ride when it's at summer camp. They come on in leaps and bounds. Um, because it's, so, it's much more challenging riding, much more interesting riding, and they really uh, benefit from it. Early morning in Norfolk. Up on the hill above the camp are the stable lines. Here's where the horses live on holiday. First thing in the morning, after mucking out, it's time for the daily inspection. <laughs> These horses know when the inspection's over, it'll be time for their first feed. Sound off, trumpeter. routine each morning is the same. It's called feed away. First an inspection and then the horses are fed. There's a midday feed away as well and so on through to the evening. Now with the morning's chores finished the soldiers can go and get their breakfast. Each year at summer camp the regiment has an open day when all the wives, families, girlfriends and local people come inside the camp to watch all kinds of displays. It's a day out for everyone, and a lot of fun, including the regimental raffle. Normally you'd have to go quite a long way to see a tug of war on horseback, but that's one thing the household cavalry does put on the agenda. Northumberland doing something for himself, and it's now time for the officer's mess team to try and pull the last one off. And that's victory for the non-commercial officers mess in its first round of the man who tell you what, well done. There's nothing the public likes better on open day than meeting the cavalry chargers, and nothing the horses like better than meeting them. There's even a supply of carrots laid on just to cement relations. But some of the public get involved in another way. There's a horse trial across country, to which anyone can bring their own horse and compete against the troopers. The course is built by Corporal Joe Weller. He's one of the riding staff, but he also learned a lot from working with Captain Mark Phillips, who's well known as designer of the famous course at Burley Horse Trials. Here, military riders compete on level terms with their civilian guests, and considering the life that cavalry chargers normally lead, they're not that easy to beat. 
A charger normally carries about 20 stone, nearly twice as much as an ordinary riding horse. And their main job is in the streets of London. But they don't all find it quite so straightforward at first. Sometimes they'll say, hey, enough's enough. Let me have a look at this. I want to see what's on the other side. But they soon get the hang of it. It's not just the cavalry horses who need to learn about cross country. Some of the civilian horses too decide whether they want another look. But most people get round without too much trouble. The problem for the course designer is anticipating the experience of horses and riders at an open event. It's the variations here which Joe Weller has to think about. His 20 odd fences were beautifully constructed and that made the cross country much more encouraging for the horses. At the end of the day, it's back home to camp. And, in a few days more, everyone returns to normal London duties. But on a more serious side, there's Bosnia. The household cavalry's already got one squadron here, as part of United Nations forces. Soon, another two will be going out. Peacekeeping's not an easy job. And here, on the Salisbury Plain, the army has a special village where they can practice techniques which are normally the job of the infantry. In the village church, there's a briefing from soldiers just returned from Bosnia. I mean, you'll get through stopping you, saying, are you going up this rope, can I have a lift? You don't give them lifts, sir. You say, no, walk. <laughs> yeah, you've always got an interpreter, and some of these interpreters, if they are BIH or you're dealing with this faction, they, they do know the people. So that does break the ice. The other one is cigarettes. OK, guys, who smokes? <laughs> and one man smoked. And he came out the front, and we were there for about two hours because he smoked roll-ups. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone sort of appearing out in the woods, yeah. So cigarettes will help. Off from the sweets, a brew from your flask. If they're going to hold you there for a while, then just chat to them and try and break the ice, because they're doing as boring a job as you are to a certain extent. Infantry tactics in a built-up area are what this scheme is all about. Instructors from the Royal Green Jackets are there to help, and some of their younger riflemen to act as the enemy. If you're doing a foot patrol, like this, it's important not to overreact to a surprise which may not be offensive. On the other hand, if a serious attack does take place, it's very important to know what to do and do it. When a foot patrol comes under attack, its first aim is to withdraw, not to fight. Because the reason for it being there in the first place was to establish information, not to get involved in a battle. So, in many ways, this infantry job is similar to their normal job as cavalry. But although the regiment may be able to swap jobs with the infantry, its main function is still with armoured vehicles. Here in Dorset, D Squadron prepares for a battle run, firing on the move. In a few weeks, they'll be going out to Bosnia. And although their role with United Nations is not supposed to be aggressive, they need to prepare for a worst case. This is the battle run, a stretch of country with four lanes, each of which represents one crew's arc of responsibility. The first thing, before going down the ranges, is important. A safety briefing by the squadron's second in command. Stand at ease! This is the safety brief. <coughs> right, come on again, man. Oh, bloody hell, that's not bad. Tell them what I've got surprised. The IG today is Captain Alam, and the AIG is Staff Bannister. You should all be familiar with them now. Who is the medic, Trooper Bentley? Trooper Campbell, sir! Well done. Right, turn about. Where is the tower? Call our stand. Sir! 
If we look half right, you'll see a green tower. That is the tower, sir. <laughs> well done. Right then, turn around, face me. Right, gentlemen, the arch today. You've all seen the arch from the last time, so I'm not going to explain them today. I'm going to get you to do them for me. Art marker number four, Mr. Goodwin Hudson. <coughs> Reference art mark board number five. Come eight o'clock of that, and there's a long scar running left to right. Art mark board number five is just above that scar. No, it's not. It's number four. Art number board number four. It's just down. down. <laughs> arc markers are the signs used to show which part of the range is allocated to which crew. Get this wrong, and you're in trouble. Up in the range tower, staff from the gunnery school are getting ready to supervise the battle run. Hello, firefighters. If you go across the EKT crossing now, you'll be safe to cross. Over. At the start of the run, the first crews are waiting for orders to go. The exercise is controlled from a Unimog, a modified truck which carries the officer in charge, technical staff and radio control systems. Now everyone's ready to go. And as the first crews start down the range, an explanation from Tom Thornycroft. Now a battle run is the nearest one can get to realistic battlefield firing. And so we divide the, the we divide the range up into quarters, one vehicle per section per section of land that they will drive down a bit of real estate and whilst they are driving down that bit of real estate in formation we pop targets up at them and they will engage them as quickly as possible and not only using the fire control they have within them but the four vehicles having fire control throughout the front and by that I mean that should four targets come across the front or even five targets, the troop leader has to delegate which target is engaged by which vehicle. Although unlikely, it is possible in the United Nations job that this level of response may be required in self-defence. It's a question of playing safe. Here in central Bosnia, the regiment's been posted to a relatively quiet area. But you can never be sure. The political situation in former Yugoslavia can blow up at any time. The Household Cavalry has a base at Gorny Vakuf, about 70 kilometres west of Sarajevo. From here, their job is to patrol 1,800 square kilometres of countryside. This way, many occasions for local conflict can be dampened down. And there's an important hearts and minds objective with the local population. In charge of the operations room in Gorny Vakuf is Captain Nick Carell. The Bosnian Serbs are shelling um, areas of civilian population. Um, the towns of Bogoino and Tomislavgrad near here have both been hit uh, in the last 24 hours, and Bogoino is currently being shelled very heavily. Uh, in response to this, and for their own safety, uh, British troops from the British base in Bogoino are um, withdrawing to our location here in Gorny Baku. This is primarily our base where we sleep and operate from. Virtually all of my troops are out on the ground right at the moment, spread across 1,800 square kilometres of Bosnia, trying to monitor what's going on on the front line. Fortunately, we're in a valley, um, and only very long-range guns can reach us here in Gorni Baku. The mountains in Bosnia can be a problem for radio communications. So, on the hilltop by the monument to President Tito, there's an outpost, manned by the regiment, to retransmit signals to the valley below. It's also a good observation point. They can watch what's happening on the low ground and keep the patrols down there in touch with the current situation. The main roads around Gorni Vakuf are guarded by the Bangladeshi army, but the job of the household cavalry is to patrol the area, making contact with the local population and with Croatian and Muslim forces. 
Covering an area over 600 square miles, they're constantly on the move. But from time to time, there's a halt to take stock beside the road. And in the best traditions of the British Army, this is also an opportunity for the crews to have a brew up before they radio in. Zero, this is Sierra 2 1, sighting at 10 17 hours. Four times Bedford lorries with approximately 50 HVO soldiers, and one times armoured personnel carrier heading north towards Gunnivar Keith. Over. Next, back on the road to finish the patrol. For the United Nations, Bosnia has become one of the most difficult problems over the last 50 years. It's hard to believe, in a country as beautiful as this, that there should be such devastating tragedies. The British soldiers here can only do their best to try and help the Bosnians find solutions of their own. It's a long way from Bosnia to London, but back at Hyde Park barracks, the ceremonial routine continues. But it's not all routine. One of the highlights for the younger soldiers is the troopers' dance. It's a fairly recent idea, but fast becoming part of the regiment's traditions. The troopers can invite their wives, or prettiest girlfriends, to a dinner and dance, where the NCOs and warrant officers act as the waiters. As might be expected from the household cavalry, it's a magnificent occasion, and a lot of fun for everyone taking part. But for the public, their fun comes from the musical ride, here in their lines at the barracks. The last time we saw the ride was practicing in Hyde Park. Now they're getting ready for the Royal Tournament. The man in the street often doesn't realize how much work's involved preparing for a major show. It's not just uniforms, but the horses kit as well. It has to be perfect too. A big favourite with the public is the drum horse, looking very laid back. Perhaps that's why he's so popular. Now it's time for the horses to be led out for one of the favourite performances of the year at any major show. Now all the training and hard work pays off. As 16 horses of the ride pirouette with perfect harmony in the propeller, one of the most difficult and attractive parts of the choreography. And now, as they break away from the propeller in a continuous flowing movement, each section circles back to opposite ends of the arena, and they're into the first of the crossover movements, the double scissors. This is followed by the single scissors, the riders crossing each other's tracks with split-second timing. These horses are mostly acquired by the army from Ireland. They're chosen for their stamina and temperament, as well as agility and speed. The weight they have to carry with a trooper in full ceremonial dress is around 20 stone. Ideally, they should stand 16-1 hands, and they have to be black. Now, as they return again to the ends of the arena, they flow into the next movement, the box scissors. drum horse. 
and trumpeters take up their positions for the fanfare. The troop circles the trumpeters. retires to the corners, the drum horse, trumpeters and the officer commanding take up their positions for the last sequence in this display, the charge. in command salutes, the salute taken by His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales, the musical ride marches off. Led by the four trumpeters, the Rough Riders, eight troopers from the lifeguards and eight from the Blues and Royals. And as they turn and move back down the sides of the arena, Coming into view, the massed bands of every cavalry regiment in the British Army, led by the mounted band of the Household Cavalry. The music is the slow march of the lifeguards. And, as the musical ride leaves the arena, the band plays Aida, the slow march of the Blues and Royals. <laughs> 